Hi, I'm Melanie Ann Phillips, co-creator of the Dramatica Theory of Story. In this episode of Beyond Dramatica, we're going to wrap up our four-part exploration of fractal psychology. Now, I thought it was going to take one part, and it's actually taken four 15-minute segments to get all of this said in its most basic... I didn't realize that we knew this much about it. What's fractal psychology, for those who are just tuning in here? It says that when a bunch of individuals come together and they reach a critical mass, they'll create a self-organizing group in which the structure and dynamics of that group take on the characteristics of the psychology of a single human mind. That's a bold statement. But that's what fractal psychology is. When individuals all sharing the same basic operating system come together, enough of them together, it'll self-organize into a larger psychology that has exactly the same fractal relationship. And if you take these pseudo-minds that are created, and you bring enough of them together, and you reach a critical mass, they will self-organize in the larger group to make it another analogy to a single human mind, another structural and dynamic replica at a fractal, in a fractal sense of what's going on in the psychologies of the smaller pseudo-minds and the elements within them. Well, we showed the chart, and I'm not going to go into any more detail about this chart because you've already seen it three times before, and I'm going horse having done four of these now uh, in the space of one day, and the last three, and I think the last hour and a half. Okay, that's the chart that holds them, and it's made up of quads. And I promised you I would tell you something of the math in these iterative equations in the quads. So here we go. In an earlier segment of this section on fractal psychology, we're looking at there being a potential, a resistance, a current, and a power or outcome, making a dramatic circuit out of each quad. Now remember, each element in the quad, even the smallest ones at the very bottom here, are processes of the mind given names. The names aren't important, but even when you go down to the very smallest level, each one of these is a process of the mind. And we've attached names to them that describe how that process relates to the other processes. And where we left off is, we were saying, how did the semantic chart work? Well, let me get this other one here again and show you close. If you look at the item over here, it says past. There it is. Past. Past is to universe, okay, as, let me get this up here, as memory is to mind. They're both in the same exact position, and they both relate to their family at the top in the same way. Memory is to mind as, there we go again, past is to universe. But also, if we look laterally, diagonally, past is to present as, over here on mine, as memory is to consciousness. So that's an analogy, too. In other words, laterally and vertically, they have relationships that hold true and consistent throughout the entire model. Then the model is twisted up twice, like a Rubik's Cube. Once with what the inequity at the heart of it looks like from the outside, and then a second time it's twisted up with what the inequity looks like from the inside. In other words, when we see a discrepancy between ourselves and our universe, it's not a problem in the universe or a problem in ourselves. It's a problem that the two of those don't see eye to eye. So that if we want something a certain way and it's not, the problem isn't that it, the thing is not that way. The problem is not that we want it that way. The problem is that we want it one way and it's another way. That's what creates the inequity. And so when we see that inequity from two sides, one of them winds up the model in a double helix and the other side winds it up in another double helix creating a quad helix. Not two helixes, two double helixes, but a quad helix that functions in toto, which represents both our internal and external sense. And then we gate between the two. We look inside, outside, inside, outside, like a piston. It's what drives our mental processes, is that tick-tock of the clock as we look outside and look inside. And how we switch that phasing, when we take a glimpse in this process of going back and forth, gives the feeling that things are moving forward, moving backward, creates depressions, creates uh, optimism. All of that depends on the relationship between phasing and gating, which is the subject of another thing. But before I go overboard on this, we have potential resistance, current, and power is true for every one of those quads and every one of those families, which is made up of quads of quads. And that's a dramatic circuit. Now, second thing we have on every single item is on each quad we also have a sequence. It's a time-space thing we're looking at. This sequence has one, two, three, four. Okay, 
That would be potential resistance, current, and power, or outcome. Okay. However, those are the two things that, that are applied to understand that model in between the two windups. So the first windup starts with potential resistance, current, and power at rest in a neutral position. Some inequity is seen from the outside, and it messes up the spatial appreciation, the outside appreciation, so that potential resistance, current, and power, as we saw in this one, are flipped and rotated. In other words, they might be rotated 90 degrees to one side or the other, depending on the kind of inequity, or they might be flipped in position while these remain the same, or these might be flipped while these remain in position. That's sort of like when um, something irritates you and you instead take the opposite tack or move it to protect it. If you have a, a particular feeling and uh, it's being irritated, you'll swap it out mentally and put the opposite in, in play to see if that works any better and protect the other part so it can heal. It's kind of like building a mental scab. And that's what happens with the flips and the rotates. It's moving things out of phase with time or space. Rotates are space, flips, I mean rotates are, are time, flips are space. And that moves things out spatially and temporally. So you apply the PRCP, rotate it once, then apply the 1, 2, 3, 4, and then rotate it all again. Now it gets doubly mixed up, and that's where we begin stories. And that's how you can look at our psychology. It's a double mixed up thing with the way the problem looks from the outside and the inside carried down to the nth dimension with a full size of mind constant. All right. Now having done that, we came up with some iterative equations. They had T over K equals AD. I'll just write that briefly. T over K equals AD. And that was saying that when we look at, at two items as being separate in here, knowledge and thought, and when we play knowledge against thought, what do we think about what we know? How does what we know change what we think? We do that against desirability, uh, the combination of desire and ability. Which means that when you talk to men, for example, logical men especially, and you say, no, oh, I didn't show that. <laughs> um, when you talk to logical men and you say, um, what about this problem? Should we solve that? How should we go about it? They say, well, we're very logical. We always use logic when we solve problems. Well, they use logic when they solve the problem, but which problem to solve is determined by desirability. If there's no desire, no matter how much ability they have, the sum is still zero. The, the multiple can is still zero. So they'll have no desire to explore that problem logically if their desire is low. If their ability is zero, even if they have a lot of desire, they won't go and explore that problem, they won't choose that problem to be the one they use their logic on because their desirability is still zero. And therefore, they think they're being logical all the time. Well, they're being logical in terms of how they go about solving the problem, but which problem they choose to try and solve, that's where they're emotional. Women use a different combination, and we'll talk about that in another area. Now, I did promise that I would talk a little bit about how this creates spirals. So I'll give you one more of these and then we'll go back to the main chart and we'll see how those spirals work, which is the iterative equations that work, which is what creates these fractal sets that work all the way up to the size of mind constant, okay? The way it works is in a quad, okay? We have one quad and let's take a quad of quads just to give an example. Suppose that the final version has a one, two, three, four in it. Well then, each one of these areas here is also going to be labeled, and maybe in this case that's a 1, and this is a 2, and this is a 3, and that's a 4. And of course these also are divided into smaller groups. Well, the way it works is that first you deal with whatever issue is in this area because it ended up with the number 1. And then you go to the number 2, the number 3, the number 4, and then you go from this number 1 set down to the number 2 set, and once again if you have a, a 1, 2, 3, 4 pattern here, then, after you finish this, 1, 2, 3, 4, you go to number 2, and you go 1, 2, 3, 4, in that order, around it. And when you've done all four of these, next one, this one, then that one, then this whole thing is going to be a number 1, and you go off to the next number 2. Now, take all that information as I find my handy-dandy chart here, and imagine that operating on this sucker, okay? Imagine that. Think about what this thing is for a moment. Think about how complex it is. Number one, it represents space and time. Uh, space is represented by looking at universe and mind. Universe and mind are fixed states, okay? External, top, at the bottom, you end up with internal, mind and psychology. You have states and processes, states that are fixed in time, universe and, and mind. And then you have processes, physics, and psychology that are processes, internal and external. This whole thing is a space-time construct. It's basically a space-time framework 
that is flexible, run by dynamics, and the dynamics determine the kind of pressures that have been brought to bear caused by an inequity between inside and outside due to the phasing and gating of the fact that we can't look inside and outside at the same time, and we change the duration of how fast we're looking inside and outside, and we don't always give each equal attention, and as a result, we're constantly moving in and out of phase, and that creates inequities like inductors and, and, um, and uh, capacitors will slow things up, move things around slower. It creates effectively a binary and an analog component to everything, and that, by the way, is the hint of creating a true self aware AI, you can't do it just with binary. You can't do it with hierarchies. You have to imagine that suppose you take two iterative equations and each one is sitting there vibrating in a medium. Okay? The iterative equation is like the binary. It gives you the sense of the discrete particle. And you get fuzzy logic and things when you start looking at the chaotic properties of how it's sitting there resonating and it's beginning to have its variables changed perhaps by the, the way it, it, uh, its own ripples affect it. But like two raisins in the same rice pudding, as one is sitting there, or a fly, <laughs> flies in rice pudding, what a horrible thought, they're sitting there thrashing around. Between them, they send out waves, and these waves react with one another. And as the iterative equations are changing, and those iterative equations are altering the manner in which they work, and, and what used to be multiplying is now dividing because the very nature of the variables is changing as a result of the iterations, these patterns are constantly going to be undulating into a constantly changing interference pattern where cones are going to rise and, and gravity wells are going to form and they're going to go higher and lower and move around and split off and recombine across a plane. If you were looking at it that way, you'd see these things happening, but we're talking four dimensions here, so it's a little more complex. As this happens, it sends out these ripples and they affect each other. The other iterative equation is getting input into its variables from another unrelated iterative equation that has the same form, in this sense a quad form based on four dimensions. So as they vibrate, because they're out of phase and because the medium slows things up and it doesn't get there immediately, it's not operating in like gears and wheels or wheels within wheels. Spatially it looks like that, but that doesn't really help you understand the patterns or predict with them. Temporally, you can't just look at it as a sequence. Remember. Looking at things as a sequence is like television scanning lines. Line by line, things move across, and they make sense as they happen. This follows that, that follows that, this follows this, a series of events. But just like scenes within movies, when you put them together, they create a larger picture that you can see, almost like a mosaic. For example, the events within a scene, the beats within an event, the scenes within an act, the acts within a story, all of these are wheels within wheels, and each one creates a different kind of scanning line, and together they form this entire chart, those four levels of, of acts and, and scenes and events and beats. That's why it's sort of recursive. It's like, a, oh, what do I want to say, like a calculus. If you go around a circle 360 degrees, you're where you started. You go 720 degrees, you're where you started again. On this chart, it has the same thing. You start at the top, and you've got items that are the largest. Then you go through the acts, the scenes, uh, the, um, uh, the, the sequences, the scenes, and you get down to the events, and the events are going to be described by the same thing that's happening at the largest. That's the fractal nature, again, temporally seen as a fractal nature temporally. Spatially, fractals are seen as the spatial record of the interference pattern created by the interaction of order and chaos. We had to coin a new word when we devised this because it's talking about temporal fractals, and we called it fractals. So instead of saying like a fractal, it's, it's fracture and fraction put together. Uh, we talked about temporal fractals, which are friction and fraction. In other words, if you break up and fracture time so that you see the individual stages as being separate chunks that repeat on the way down, you get fractal patterns. And it's the combination here, <laughs> there, of fractals and fractals coming together that creates a complex interference pattern that is the story mind and creates all of those interesting sets, similar but not exactly like Mandelbrot sets, Julian sets, and all based on the quad format with those equations. That's all I'm going to talk about fractal psychology for now. I may revisit it someday, but I've just used up almost a total of 60 minutes here. I've only got 20 seconds left to sign off. I hope this made sense. As usual, write me at youtube at storymind.com, and I will answer your questions if I have time. Um, and also, don't forget to visit storymind.com for all the writing stuff, and go to dramaticopedia.com for the complete collection of all the materials that have ever been written down and recorded that have to do with Dramatica. Thanks.